the live link is. There we go. So that was a little harder than it should have been. I'm just going to put the live link um, into the links. Okay, so I think that should be right. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, let me just... Uh, let me just play with that first. Um, yeah, there we go. So welcome everyone. Um, in case you're not aware, and where is it? It's up there. That's, uh, this is CET 466. My normal um, class on Saturdays is CET 236. So this is, and I think, can somebody please mute uh, Make sure everybody's muted just so that you can, uh, every, it doesn't uh, interfere too much with the audio. Thank you very much. Um, where are we? So there we go. And um, yeah, so this is logic design. You should know something about digital circuits for this course um, because the prerequisite for this course is CET 363. I've forgotten the name of that course, something like Digital Logic. So you should be familiar with AND gates and OR gates and that sort of stuff. So I'll go back to Mini-Me and I will move that over here. Actually, let's just leave it there, that's okay. And we'll just go to the, the full screen version. So my name, in case you don't know me, is Peter Katsukas. I have degrees in um, electrical and systems engineering. That's control systems engineering, which is a bit different. Uh, you should know what my email address is. That's it there. As far as I'm aware, everybody in the class is a CET student. Let me know if you're not. Um, I assume you've got all the prerequisites, so it, doesn't, it, it shouldn't matter which program you're in. But uh, uh, let me know in case there's uh, something that I can uh, add based on your different background. So there's no required textbooks for this course. Um, I am going to be referring back to what used to be, and I'm not sure if it still is, the 363 uh, textbook, which is, what's it called, Widmer, Moss and Tochi are the, the authors. Um, you should probably see the, the, the cover in one of the, the text channels. I think Dan um, was asking about the, the, the textbook and I, I posted a, a picture of the cover um, in one of the text channels. So that's there. Um, we're completely online this time around. So um, uh, I'm going to be putting out links and information um, both I'm hoping to make sure I do it both in Blackboard and in um, Discord uh, but uh, and please let me know if you see something in one that you don't see in the other that would be that would be good just so that I can make sure I keep things in sync I'm going to be a bit busier teaching than I normally am um, I'm teaching as an adjunct here at Central Connecticut and uh, I'm teaching as a uh, visiting faculty at uh, Fairfield, but I'm technically full time at Fairfield. In fact, that's why I was a little late for today's class. A, because I thought class didn't start until 9.25 and B, because I had a staff meeting from eight o'clock this morning for Fairfield. Um, Fairfield also has a lot of uh, 
adjunct professors and it's hard to get everybody together during the nine to five week because they have day jobs. Um, so we usually have our, our uh, staff meetings either in the evenings during the week or early morning on Saturdays. Okay, so uh, that's what we're aiming to do. I'm gonna talk at you a little bit. Um, I'm hoping to put together some, some uh, videos uh, that will mean you can look at them offline, out, different from this live stream. Um, and, uh, but I'll, I'll post links to those. It'll be for some specific uh, topics. Um, most of what we're talking about uh, is, is, uh, is a bit generic and there's plenty of stuff on the, the, the internet for you to look for if you, if you need it. Most of what you should need, you should get from the Saturday morning classes. Um, I'm going to be aiming to split up the, the classes on Saturdays between me talking to you and doing some problems perhaps, and discussion about stuff. And then the second half, what we'll probably do is, is the labs. Um, if you haven't done it already, I'd suggest you try and download uh, the Quartus app. It's quite large. Um, also, uh, it would be nice if you could get Git installed and clone the Git repository. I'll show you how to do that in the second, in the back end of today's session. Um, but uh, let's... Uh, at least try and uh, get stuff downloaded um, while while uh, I'm I'm talking. Maybe where are we going? Hmm, things are a little slow. Why well, are things a little slow? Oh, maybe it's just my keyboard. Okay, so um, this is. Uh, what we've got ahead of us, right? Um, I'm not sure the topics are exactly in sync with the time. Um, I'll try and keep it in sync. The main thing of interest is, should be the, the project side of things. A lot of what's in this course is project-based. Um, and I think I'm going to talk about that shortly, what, what the accessible items, what your deliverables are. Um, and you can see the projects. I have 10 projects that I want you to do. Um, and at the end of this semester, um, we're going to spend some time on a project that you want to do. Um, I, for the labs, um, most of what you need to do in the labs can be done uh, with a simulator, but I do want you to uh, uh, try using, let me see if I can, so I have uh, a few of these boards. Let me just um, go to bigger me and show you. So I have a few of these, um, boards, right? So the things we're actually designing for is that big chip in the middle. That's called an FPGA or a field programmable gate array. And this is just a development board. It has some communication mechanisms here. It has four push buttons down here. It's got some LEDs. It's got some seven segment displays. That round black thing in the middle is a buzzer, so you can make it buzz. Um, it also has a, uh, a VGA output. So one thing you can do with uh, one of your digital projects is to make a VGA signal come out of the, um, out of the board. Now the, the slight downside with those um, devices is that uh, I only have 12 of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pair you up for the labs. 
and maybe some there might have to be because there are 27 students there might have to be maybe three groups of three and because we're all socially distancing only one person in that group will be able to have access to the the board however um, it's possible we can uh, you can transfer that board between you um, but uh, we'll, we'll see I, I would like to to try and uh, get at least m most of the class using the board at least once what we may do is uh, have the class uh, the one lab partner do half the labs and then the other lab partner do the other half of the, the labs but we'll see I'll have to uh, schedule times with everybody individually to get uh, to, to hand over those boards and the easiest thing for me would be to meet somewhere at uh, in one of the CCSU car parks to hand them off but we'll aim to schedule that uh, 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 starting well starting next week but um, we won't need it until uh, week three uh, when it'd be nice to, to use quarters with it okay I'm just gonna take a, a sip of my coffee I might just see if I can mute while I do that because you don't want to hear me slurping Okay, so so that's um, let me go back to my full screen. So that's where we are um, the first week, and what I'm going to talk about today is just reviewing um, uh, where we are and there's two pieces to it and I, I'm I'm taking these this information from two main sources one source is that uh, Widma Moss and Tochi um, 363 textbook the other source is there's a website called NAND to Tetris and I would actually think about swapping everything over to that but I, I don't know whether I can quite do that given the uh, um, given the, the the prep time it might take but Nanta Tetris is a textbook that um, teaches digital design but all the way from uh, taking you know AND gates and NAND gates hence the NAND part of it all the way up to creating a processor that you can run and program the game Tetris on right so it's it's a pretty full-on and uh, what do they call it soup to nuts sort of experience it goes all the way from the start right at the start all the way to the end we're not quite I don't think it'll quite fit into the scope of this course um, maybe if I had two semesters to do it um, but it's a good the 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 first couple of uh, they call them projects are, are pretty good and very relevant to what the the content in uh, uh, logic design is so let's see if we can go to the next one so these are the accessible items um, there's 10 labs worth 30 percent total so three percent each there's one large paired project which is worth 20 percent um, I found this really good guy actually um, one of the the past students um, told me about a game he found on Steam that it's called micro hard MHRD and it's all about uh, writing in a hardware description language a simplified version of a real one but still it's an, an HDL um, that uh, is is written as a game and uh, everybody except three people in the class the the most recent people who were waitlisted I, I'm aiming to get some more keys um, but everybody in the class has a key apart from those three people has a key for that MHRD game 
that you can uh, log into Steam and uh, uh, activate to, to get access to the game. Okay, so uh, if you finish the game, you get 10% of the grade for this course. And I'll, I'll aim to demonstrate the game a little later in this morning's session. This morning's session, we're not going to talk too much about digital logic. We will talk a little bit. Um, but it's mostly about setting the stage and all the, the red tape that we've got to go through. The other two assessable items is uh, there will be two oral midterms. So that's oral online midterms. Um, what I'll do is, uh, in case you haven't done one of these before, is about two weeks before the, uh, the time of the midterm, I will uh, release the exam paper. And the exam paper usually has uh, several topics on it. And each topic has three or four questions. And for the oral exam, I will ask, I will get you online on a one on one basis and get you to um, answer one question from each of the topics on the exam. So, for example, there might be four topics on the exam paper. Each, quest, each topic may have five questions. I will ask you four questions one of the five questions per topic and you can uh, then explain it to me um, and i've found that a very effective way of determining uh, what a student knows and even better it gives me a much better way of giving uh, individualized feedback because what i usually do after each oral is over is i give specific feedback about if there was, if I found any holes in your knowledge about the, the topics that I questioned you about. Um, if you haven't done an oral, and um, this is applies to even if you have, um, what I usually do is uh, the first oral, in this case the midterm, is optional. And by that I mean uh, you should take it, but if the midterm grade reduces your overall course grade, then I won't use it because the idea is that you've, you've, you know, you're still figuring out how to do an oral midterm and maybe you don't do such a great job of it. And then uh, by the time you come to the final, you've got a better idea of what you need to do and you do better on the final. So I'll, I'll use your final grade or replace the percentage you get in your final grade with uh, whatever the midterm was. Of course, if you do better on the midterm than the final, that, that, that you keep the, the midterm grade uh, and uh, you keep the final grade. Any questions so far? No. No? Good. Okay. Uh, me... Yes. Yeah, go for it. What's up? Uh, how would you prefer we raise our hands for <laughs> if we had a question or something? Do you want us to just post a message to the discussion channel? Uh, yeah, that might be the best. Um, my, what I might have to do, um, actually, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, I, my, my only problem with that is for me, um, I, I need a, a third screen, but I just realized I can use my, my phone as my third screen. So I'll, that way I'll be able to see questions because other, when I, like when I have my, um, uh, the PowerPoint like this, for example, um, I, uh, my second screen has the, uh, the speaker view of the, of PowerPoint. So I don't, uh, I don't see it so much. I don't see anything from the, uh, the the Discord chat, but if I have my phone on the uh, on the the discussion uh, part of Discord, then I can see it. So yes, that just just post in the discussion part. How will yeah, thank the, you. Uh, so here Jacob's asking, how will the review go for the exams? Will be given all the questions? Yes, that that's the aim. So what I what I aim to do, Jacob, is um, I. Uh, 
the the actual exam paper will be released I, I say two weeks sometimes it's only a week before um, the the exam time and uh, then what I do I don't do the exams during the usual class session I'm I get you to book your your class your exam times through the the um, Outlook bookings uh, page that I, I make available and uh, that way you you can book at a, a time that suits you I usually give a window of about 10 days for people to um, to book it so it'll be usually you know from the the Monday before a class to the Friday after a class given if the class is on a Saturday like this one is okay and then sometime and I usually make time available early like starting at 8 o'clock or 7 30 and late going up until about 8 30 9 o'clock okay and that usually gives people who work or or have other commitments to uh, to choose a time that suits you okay does that answer the question You're welcome. Okay, so um, let's go on to the next one. So um, I want you to think about a digital project you can do. Um, it should be reasonably large and we're going to use Quartus Prime and we'll program the boards. It'll, this will be done in a, in a, a pair or a group of three. Um, so you, you don't have to necessarily think of your own, but uh, it's, it's worthwhile having a, th a think about it. Um, so it's got to solve a reasonably complex digital logic problem. And uh, one of the things I, I try and stress both in this course and in any programming course I, I give is it's nice to have a test suite around your product, your, your project. And the, with which what we'll see a little later with um, Quartus is it's possible to run tests around your VHDL code in Quartus. Um, there are things called glitches or hazards that happen in uh, digital logic. And this is usually due to propagation delays being different through different parts of the circuit. So uh, maybe a, a digital logic one arrives at one input of an AND gate a little bit after the, the other input arrives. And so you get an abrupt change. It usually looks like a spike in the, the output. Um, and we want to try and avoid those. Uh, we do want to run on the, those development boards that I showed you earlier. Um, you don't have to have it now. Like I, I, I showed you the, uh, the timing. It's going to be towards the end of semester and uh, the last four or five weeks of semester. We'll, we'll be spending um, the lab time, in-class lab time, working on those. Okay, so um, ju this is a, uh, I, I taught this class last time in um, fall of 2018, so I, I didn't, didn't teach it in the fall last year. Um, but this is an example of uh, the, one of the exams I had. So this is a, a listing, VHDL is, uh, what is it? I've forgotten what it stands for now. That's, that's, that's bad. Um, so HDL stands for um, Hardware Description Language. So what you're going to be learning in this course is how to program digital logic devices. And this is an example of a uh, digital logic device and you can see there's there's various uh, parts to the code 
you like, the lines, um, well, line one says that we're using a library and it's the IEEE library. And then the next three lines are talking about using a specific part of the IEEE library. Okay, and then the uh, next uh, lines 6 through 19 define the um, uh, interface, it's called entity, the interface into a device, right? And you can see it's generic and we've got um, width, depth, address, and then we've got a port and we have various um, inputs and then an output on the port. And uh, the, so what, what's happening here is generic is like telling it uh, these are some constant values. So width has a value 4, depth has a value 4, address has a value 2. And then you can see down on lines 14, 15, 16 and 17, address ADDR and width are used um, so that that's, that tells us how big the logic vectors are for read address, write address, data in and data out. So that, that just all that's doing is defining the, uh, the interface and then below that we've got the architecture. The architecture is the implementation, right? So it says architecture behave of question one, question one being the name of the entity. And part of why, why I called it question one rather than something a bit more explicit is because I wanted uh, students to be able to read through this and understand what it's doing. This is the first class of this course. You don't know what it's doing yet. Um, this question was on the final, all right? So I'm hoping by the time we get closer to the end of the course that you'll be able to read through what's happening in this and understand um, the, uh, understand the, what, what it's doing. So, um, I'm going to try something and I'm not sure it's going to work, but we will see. So what I'm going to try is um, Oh, maybe I've got the answers there. Oh, I'll, I'll it's okay. I'll I'll just go on. I was going to try and and uh, do some some funky stuff with the the, the chat rooms. But anyway, so the two questions that were were relevant to that piece of code is what does the VHDL code do? All right, and this particular one, it's actually doing what's called a dual ported RAM. All right, so a dual ported RAM is a, uh, a memory device that has two sides to it, dual sides. Usually it's got an input side and it's got an output side. And what it does is on a rising clock edge and with an able high, the read process checks the read address and outputs the value at that address if the read input is high. If the read is not high, the output is set to high impedance. And, uh, and the second question is explain what the generic block in listing one does and the generic block allows setting symbolic names for numbers instead of using magic numbers. Okay, so the two pieces that are doing something here. This is all just definition on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we've got two pieces. We've got a process 
and we've got a process, right? Process clock read, process clock write. And you can see that uh, if the clock is one and enable is one and read is one, then we put something out onto data. If read is not one, we set the output to this Z value. And then the other process is process clock write. And if clock is one and enable is one and write is one, then we take data from the input and we put it into the, uh, the RAM value. Now, that sort of looks like maybe a programming language that you've seen before. There's one very, very, very big difference between VHDL and any other programming language that you've done before. Any other, um, except maybe Verilog, right? Any other hardware description language. Um, what happens between this begin and this end is this process and this process are happening at exactly the same time. Once you're within a process, it's just like any other language. It, it happens sequentially, right? That's what we can do if then else's. But anything between this begin and this end outside of a process begin end is all happening at exactly the same time, right? So that's a, that's a little different from what you've seen before. So that, I've already said this, but it's the aim is to apply the 363 knowledge to FPGAs. Remember FPGA is Field Programmable Gate Array. And there are several languages that allow you to do this. Um, VHDL is the one I'm going to be using. Um, there is also Verilog HDL, which is very similar. Um, the student, the former student that I've been talking to actually prefers Verilog, um, but all of my, well, most of my examples are in VHDL and I, I know VHDL a little better. So I decided to stick with VHDL. Okay. Um, and as you saw from the list of deliverables, we've got quite a bit of lab work to do. And I'm aiming to, to get you to, um, to do, at least install the, some of the tools today. Um, if you have a Mac, um, you won't be able to use the tools. You won't be able to install the tools. The ones that uh, Intel makes available are, um, only seem to be available for uh, uh, Windows or Linux at the moment. However, the tools I just checked yesterday and uh, they didn't tell me that they'd finished it, but the, the tools are available on the, the one of the uh, engineering desktops through the Citrix server um, for, uh, at school. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do that because um, I, I can't run uh, Quartus on my machine here. I have to go on to the, um, the Citrix server to get it. Now I do want to demonstrate how that works. Okay, some uh, thank yous are in order. Um, Professor Zanella uh, provided me with all the initial materials. That was, that was very useful. Thank you to her. Um, a former colleague of mine, uh, Jasmine Banks, is at the Queensland University of Technology and she taught a similar uh, FPGA course and uh, shared, was kind enough to share her notes with me as well when I first taught this course, which is very good. Um, uh, Johan Stonkik at, in the Netherlands has also shared uh, some of his notes, which I, I'm very appreciative of. Um, the One of the authors, uh, of the NAND to Tetris um, uh, book and all the associated materials um, 
Shimon Shokin has also shared his notes, and I'm going to be talking to some of his notes as well. And uh, finally, uh, the, the, the author of the MicroHard game has been kind enough to donate the, uh, the game keys, and I'm, I'm going to have to go back to him and ask him for another three keys. Uh, so apologies to the, the, those three students. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll have to, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can get those so that you can play the game as well. Okay, that's all I have for that series of slides. So what I thought I'd do, um, I haven't shared it on uh, so let me put that into the uh, the link here. All right, so um, this is uh, What one thing I do like doing is um, writing on a, a whiteboard, and um, that's been a little harder since we went online. But I found out that OneNote um, a lets me write as as if it's on a whiteboard, and b. Um, you should be able to see that uh, I've shared this with everybody, right? So everybody in the class, right? There's there's Jacob, for example, should have access to a um, some student specific notes if you need them. I don't I don't use the student specific stuff very much. Sometimes I I use it for. Um, the oral exams, if I need to share pictures and things with individual students. Um, but if you need to, there's, there's those. You should also, if you use that link that I put in the links um, channel on Discord, um, you should also be able to see all of my notes, the, the notes that I'm going to be writing. I'm not sure how many notes right, I'm going to write, but I, I do like using the whiteboard, so um, I'll see. So, um, digital logic, right? That means we've got two values. We've got a one and a zero, or a true and a false, right? And there's three ways um, to talk about uh, logic expressions. Well, two way, three ways to talk about logic. Can anybody tell me? Let me see if this works. Can anybody tell me, and I'm going to try So, uh, Saibo, can you tell me one way that you might want to be able to uh, write an expression for a, a, a logic function? You might have to take yourself off mute, and I can't see you in the list there. So let me try somebody else. Mohammed, how about you? No, I'll go through somebody else. 
Oops. Way, how about you? Any any thoughts on? Uh, I could have a volunteer. I, I just I like I prefer volunteering people. That way, I get everybody rather than just the people who volunteer all the time. <laughs> so, Dan, how about you? You 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 tell me if you want to volunteer. And just one. Yes, just one, please. Okay, uh, as a, like a Boolean algebraic expression. Yeah, that'll do. So let's. Uh, that's the first one. We got a Boolean algebraic expression, right? And these things look like, you know, x equals a b c or a b bar c bar or a bar b, something like that, as an example, right? This way of writing them is sometimes called the SOP way of writing it, which is stands for sum of products, right? Now, even though it says sum, this operation is really an OR operation, right? We use the plus sign, but it's really an OR operation. And even though one way to write this is with a dot or even a, a, a multiplication sign, these operations aren't multiplication, they're the AND operation. Okay, so that's one way of uh, writing a, a logic expression. Is there, can somebody tell me another way? Let me, let me try my bingo again. Uh, why did it? Not seems I have to click. Might be because um, oh, it's because sorry. <laughs> that was you, wasn't it? <laughs> so that's me again. Oh well, you you. <laughs> Let me. Uh... Tommy, how about you? Any? Uh, I'm trying to look through my notes, but I don't know. You don't know? Oh, thank you for thank you for answering. That's good. Well, I'm not going to answer. <laughs> I. Uh... Naz, how about you? You have a, a thought on what another way to represent a, a Boolean expression is? Would it be truth tables? Yeah, that's another way. That's a good one. So that's the other way, or another way anyway. Let me go back to the drawing operation, see if I can. So the other way is a, a, a truth table, right? And the truth table for this particular one, and I'm hoping I could got the room, right, is a B, C, and X, and then we might have to draw that. And then what we do is because our Boolean variables, our A, our B, and our C, can only take on 
one of two values, 0 or 1, we can enumerate all possible outputs. Right? In this case, there are three variables, and so we have only eight possible combinations. Right? And A, B, C is this one here. A, B bar, C bar is 1, 0, 0, is that one. And A bar, B, A bar is 1 when A is 0. And A bar, B is 1 when A is 0 and B is 1. So that's those two. And I might need one there. And then all the others are zero. Okay. So there's a there's a, a second way of representing exactly the same thing. There's this um, Boolean algebra or Boolean algebraic expression. There's the truth table. And there's actually there's actually a, a couple of others. Um, I'm, I'll, another variant on the truth table is, and I'll, I'll call this 2A because it's almost the same sort of thing. And that's a Carnot map. Right? And a Carnot map takes this truth table but makes it... Um, Uh, basically two-dimensional, right? So in this case, the Carnot map for... And I need to write another one up there. Right, so... We've got A here. And we've got B, C here. And I hope I get this right. Zero 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 one 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 zero. And then basically, so zero 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 was a zero. Zero 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 one was a zero. Zero one zero was a one. Zero one one was a one. Uh, one zero one is a one. Eek, no. One zero zero. One zero zero was a one. One zero one is a zero. One one zero is a zero, and one 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 is a one. Right. So this is exactly the same information as, as up here, right? But we've made it into a, a two-dimensional thing. And the beauty of a Carnot map over um, a truth table is a Carnot map lets us do simplification, right? Back up here, what we could have done here is we could have noticed something about this. We could have done some manipulation on this to get a simpler expression. What a Carnot map lets you do is it lets you uh, do it graphic, do that simplification graphically, right? So there's, there's unfortunately, there's no simplification you can do for that one, but here, We've got a simplification we can do there by grouping those two, and a simplification we can do there by grouping those two. In fact, let me just um, use a couple of different colors so we can see the differences. All right? So, in this case, our, well, let's start with x equals in white and then go to blue. 
So the blue one here is A, B bar, C bar, right? A, B bar, C bar. And then the green one, what it lets you do is it's saying green covers the case where C is both a one and a zero. So we don't care what value C has. So this green one is going to be when A is zero and B is one. So it's going to be A bar B. And then the red one covers the case when it doesn't care what A is. A can be zero and A can be one. And it's when B is one and C is one. Okay, so that's, that's another um, way of representing our Boolean expression, but it's, it's um, very similar to the truth table. There is a third version. So let me uh, try bingo again. Matt, any idea what the third version of what we're looking at is? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, let's, let's see if somebody else has a go. Thank you for answering. Yeah. Jacob? A logic circuit? Oh, my God. Yeah, that, okay. That was Tommy, was it? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. That's the lo it's the third version that I was looking for is the logic circuit, right? The circuit version. Right? And there's a few ways to do this. And I'm, I'm going to be prosaic about it. I'm just going to implement this version because it's a little simpler to draw. Right? If we have A... B and C, right? And then we need a, we don't, we need an A bar, a B bar and a C bar. So the simplest way to do this is to just get all the variables and their complements, remember, this is a not gate. It's sometimes called a complement. Um, there's another word for it. I've forgotten what the other word for it is. Right, so now we have A, A bar, B, B bar, C, C bar. Right, I tend to write bar, another way of writing C bar is C prime, right? Sometimes it's easier for me to type C prime rather than typing C bar. If I put something in the in the chat, I'll probably use prime rather than over bar. Okay, so now we have all of these terms and then we have three products we have to form and the products, as we said earlier, are AND gates Right, so we need three AND gates, and I apologize for my horrible looking AND gates, but anyway, the first one has A, B bar, C bar, right, so that is A, B bar, C bar. The second one has A bar and A bar B. I'm not sure what the best way to do this is. So I'm going to do it that way. And then B, this could be a little messy, right? So there's our A bar B. And then I need a B, C. So I'm just going to bring B down here, 
and then C I'll I'll um, go across here so there's our BC and now I need an OR gate right and so here is our X okay so they're the they're the three ways you can represent a, a simple logic gate everybody happy with that any questions about that would you be able to use like a waveform um sort of um so um uh, it's not as quite as um explicit but uh, uh certainly a timing diagram can be um indicative of these but usually those sorts of diagrams are are really hard it's really hard to go from that diagram back to one of these three things right um you can cert certainly these three things can generate that timing diagram right you can see the how the how the uh the ones and zeros change and let me just see if i can quickly find an example um timing diagram let's see if we can find it for a full adder and i'm just googling yeah there we go so let's see if that's available easily okay let's put that on the right screen okay so this is a, a this, is this the sort of thing you were meaning yes yeah right so this is a this is a timing diagram and um on the the, the top three a b and c are the inputs and this is for a, a full adder circuit you should hopefully remember what a an adder is um, a and B are the, uh, the, the two one-bit numbers that you have to add. C is the carry input um, that you have to put in. And then you have to add those three things together and you get the sum, which is the S output. And if there's a carry on the sum, you get a, an output at the C out. Right? The trouble with, with these sorts of diagrams is there could, it could be the case that um, a different combination. It's it, this isn't guaranteed to excite to, to to change the inputs to every possible combination of the inputs, right? It may be that you can't find a a, a particular slice of time on this diagram where. Uh, you have every possible input of A, B, and C. In this case, I think it does have every possible input, um, but it's it's not necessary. It's not one of the things that you usually use timing diagrams for. But yeah, that's a that's a good point though. Um, you could certainly eyeball these things and 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 you know get a pretty good idea about what the logic uh, gate or the logic being implemented is. It's just um, it it doesn't necessarily tell you that because you, as I said, you need to have being able to excite every possible input in order to. Whereas, um, so you may not get that excitation happening here. Whereas for each of these three, right, um, this is capturing all possible inputs A, B, and C. Here we've actually enumerated every possible input A, B, and C same in the Kano map and again this is it it doesn't matter what values a b and c have this Im implements the uh the logic directly okay that makes sense okay 
Uh, but now, good qu good question. It's a it's a we we will have to deal with. Uh, so I'll put that in here, and let me just um, write it up. So uh, so timing diagrams. can show um, the logic but may not um, excite all possible input values. Okay. And let me just, oh, I'll leave that there. Okay, so um, that's the start. What I'm going to do now is I, I put a link into the, um, where's it gone? There we go. Uh, in uh, one of them, I put a link into the um, NAND to Tetris. Uh, slides and I'm going to talk to these chapter one slides brief. I'm not going to talk in detail to to everyone um, but uh, let's see if that works okay so these um, and I, my interaction with these people has have been uh, with uh, Shimon Shock and, and he's, he's been very helpful um, in uh, providing uh, backup for this. So I really do appreciate um, what he's done. Um, so that's, uh, that's where I got these from and there should be a link. I think I put it in Blackboard. I'm not sure I put it in Discord. So that might be another disconnect between what's in Discord and what's in Blackboard. In fact, let's just go to Blackboard and check. Wherever it got to, there it is there. Right, so um, lecture slides. The slides that I spoke to initially uh, up here. This is, I, I'm not sure I really should be linking directly to it, but this is a, a link to the, the slides I'm going to talk to now. And they're, they're under the, the lecture slides. Um, in case you haven't seen it, uh, have a look through this. You probably don't need all of these. I suggest getting OneNote. Um, probably don't need most of those. I suggest getting GitHub and a, a Git client. We will need multi-sim. We will need uh, Quartus Prime Lite. And that gives, uh, should link to the CET 466 uh, playlist, I think. I set it up to auto tag. So yes, the, this is the live version that's coming there now. So that's, um, and I'll delete this test once, uh, once we finish today's session. Okay, so make sure you have a look at that. And uh, particularly these uh, I've forgotten how to do, go to full screen. How do I go to full screen? Uh, that way. Okay. So Boolean logic. Right. And on and or rather off and on, false and true, no and yes, zero and one. They're all Boolean values. Only possible values are zero and one. Only two possible values. And there's lots of ways to represent it. Here we've got um, X and Y, X or Y and not X. Um, I tend not to use the up arrow, down arrow and uh, bracket version of things. I tend to use the uh, plus version for and, Sorry, the dot version for and, the plus version for or, 
and either overbar or prime for not. And these are the, the basic Boolean operations, and, or, and not, and their truth tables, right? This is just for two inputs. You can do three input and and or. Not always only has one input. Okay, you should be okay with those. Right? And there's some example Boolean expressions, right? And it's it's going through uh, the the um, what do you call it? The way to simplify it. So it's using the uh, pre operator precedence rules. So in the first case, the uh, the, the first thing you evaluate is one and one. One and one is always one. So that's why the next line says zero or one inside the bracket. Again, operator precedence, zero or one is also one. And then not one comes out to zero. Right, and here's a... Uh, a more complicated one where we've got x, y, and z, and a function f is the output, and we can f go from the Boolean algebra expression at the top and gradually fill out the uh, truth table. Right, and there are two of the example, uh, two of the ways we talked about um, being able to get. Um, uh, represent a, a, a Boolean function. There's lots of laws about um, how to do Boolean algebra, right? There's commutation, there's association, there's distribution. Those three um, you should be already familiar with through normal math, right? X times Y equals Y times X. X plus Y equals Y plus X. That works in normal math. Um, if you associate... Uh, so X times Y times Z, Z is equal to x times y times z, right? It doesn't matter which order you do the those particular operations because multiplication is associative with other multiplications, and and is associated is associative with other ands, or is associative with other ors. And is not associative with or, or is not associative with and. And then you can distribute as well, just like you can with, with normal mathematics or normal algebra even. Um, De Morgan's laws are a little different, right? Here, what you do is you replace and with or and or with and and you replace the... Um, uh, complement with the uncomplemented version or the uh, uncomplemented version with the um, complemented. So uh, not x, x and y is equal to not x or not y and not x or y is equal to not x and y. Let's just, I'm, I tend to write those a little differently, so let me just write that down, write down the way I write it. So, De Morgan's Laws. Right, and 
the first one was um, AB bar right, equals A bar or B bar. And the other one is A or B all barred equals let's make that a little wider so it looks like an A A bar B bar right and just a friendly reminder A B all barred is not equal to A bar B bar all right and we can we can see that by writing out the truth table all right so zero 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 one one zero one one so A and B barred A and B is zero Bard is 1, A and B is 0, 1, A and B is 0, it's 1, A and B is 1, output is 0. A bar, B bar, A bar, B bar is 1 and 1, which is 1. A bar 1, B bar is 0, and it is 0. Uh, A bar is 0, B bar is 1, and it together is 0. A bar is 0, B bar is 0. Right? So you can see they're very different logic functions. So be very careful with uh, that particular way of looking at things. Okay, sorry, that was a little bit of a diversion, but I just wanted to write out um, De Morgan's laws a little bit better. Okay, so here's some more... Um, Boolean algebra line by line and the idea is to just go through and um, simplify the original expression and as you can see it goes uh, it goes uh, all the way through to uh, x or y at the end right so it's that's pretty And that's another way to do it, right? Just looking at it, instead of doing the, the algebraic version, we do it using a, uh, a truth table. With the truth table, we've got to recognize that that's a, an X or Y operation, right? It's a, little, it's a little harder to see it directly. So, one of the nice things about these three ways of representing Boolean functions is you can go from one to the other to the other, right? So this particular one, right, we, we have to um, look at each one in particular, each one in the F column, and figure out what its Boolean algebra expression is, and then we're doing an OR operation with all of them. And that's just the, the what I talked about before, the sum of products way of, of representing um, the function.
Right, and here's some little uh, lemmas. Lemmas, I always think of lemmas as tiny theorems, right? Or a tiny result, sometimes a tiny corollary of a bigger theorem. So any Boolean function can be represented using an expression containing and, or, and not operations. And we just saw that, how to do that in the previous slide. And any Boolean function can be represented using an expression containing and and not operations. That's interesting, right? And the because what we're doing is we're saying, we're using that, that proof line there that shows that we can generate the or operation using only not and and. If we can generate the or operation using only not and and, that means we can go back one step to the previous lemma and say, okay, we, we know how to generate or from and and or, so now we've got and not and, sorry, we know how to generate or from and and not, so now we can gen we have and not and or, that means we can do any Boolean expression, right? And then there's a, that's why he's asking the next question, can we do better than this? And the answer is we can, we can if we have what's called a NAND operation, right? The NOT AND, and that's the truth table for the NOT AND operation. And the theorem now, right? So a, a lemma is a tiny result, and the theorem's the big one. The theorem says that any Boolean function can be represented using an expression containing NAND operations only. Sometimes that 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 means that the uh, the NAND operation is is called um, a universal logic gate. The NOR function is also a universal logic gate, right? So we can generate any logic function we want if we only have NAND gates. It may look a little clunky. Um, right? Remember before I used um, a NOT gate, I used a an AND gate and I used an OR gate, but I could have written that whole thing using just a NAND operation. Okay, I think I have been talking for too long. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna quickly, right? So we have the, uh, uh, we have the, the NOT gate, right? You should remember that one. We have the AND gate, and I'm just gonna draw a two input. It has a flat back and a, a it's a bad AND gate, but anyway, and a, and a curved front with a, without a point. And then we have a curved back and a pointy front for the um, OR operation. And then we also have the NAND gate, or not AND. We draw that like an AND gate, except we have a complement bubble on the out output, and that's a NAND, right? And then the OR has something similar, the NOR gate, which again looks like an OR gate, but has a, a complement bubble on the output, and that's a NOR. And both of these devices, the NAND and the NOR, are sometimes called universal gates. And the reason is they're called that is because of that theorem we just talked about, which says that I can generate any logic function using just NAND gates. Okay, I think I've talked at you a little bit long. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a five minute break, right? And maybe you can stretch your legs. I'm gonna stretch my legs briefly. And um, 
I'll put a five minute timer up there before actually before we do that um, does anybody have any questions based on anything that I've talked to so far anybody if not um, I'm gonna start that timer and uh, we'll, we'll come back in about uh, five minutes. I'll keep the stream going. I don't know what happens if I stop the stream. and um, So there'll be a five minute blank. And so you should be able to scroll forward. Is that a question? No, I was going to say see you in five minutes. Okay, see you in five minutes.
Okay. And we're back, maybe. Let me just get uh, my slides back up. So I'm I'm not going to be able to get through. Oops, it's going to play. I didn't want it to play. I'm not going to be able to get through um, all of these, but let's let's um, have a bit of a talk through it anyway. Right. So here's another um, logic gate. It's a an exclusive OR. Right, so this is a, um, it looks like an OR gate, but it's got a double line, double curved line on the input side where the A's and B's are. And this one, whereas the standard OR gate has a, a one in three parts of the truth table, the exclusive OR only has a one in two when only one of the inputs is high then the output is high. If either both outputs are high or both outputs are low, the out, sorry, both inputs are high or both inputs are low, the output is low for an exclusive all. Right, so the, the process we're going to, to look at in, in doing this course is we're going to design the gate architecture, specify the architecture in a high uh, hardware description language and then test the the chip on a hardware simulator um, and then I'm not I don't know how much optimization will do most of the the devices we're going to make are pretty pretty simple so it's hard to optimize but we can do some optimization we can certainly do some testing and then we'll deploy that uh, tested uh, HDL onto silicon, that, that device that I showed you before. Right, and I might put my uh, mini B back up there. There we go. Okay, uh, let's see what else is in this, these slides. Right, so um, in fact, why don't I look at, why don't I show you, see if I can start up the, um, the game, that might be good. Right, so, so these slides, the, the downside of these slides is this um, language here is, is neither VHDL nor um, Verilog. Right, but it, it all of them do something very similar. They define the inputs, they define the outputs, and they define the connections from the inputs to the outputs. So it's it they're all pretty similar in that regard. They have some uh, differences in terms of the syntax and and how you you state things, but they they all aim to do the same thing. But let me um, let me try figuring out where that game got to. Where did I put the game? I think I put it in... There, maybe? Maybe not. There it is. So this is the game, and I hope you can hear that. This is what uh, an old computer used to sound like booting up. <laughs> and um, the interface is pretty clunky. It's a text interface. And um, let's just have a look, right? So. 
the aim of the micro hard uh, company is to build a, a CPU, right? Um, there's um, various things we need to do. Usually the, and I can I put it, I don't know whether I can, it's a bit hard to show the, uh, let me see if I can put a, oh, no audio? Oh, maybe I haven't got my um, audio capture set up properly. That's okay. It, it, it's just a little funny, that's all. It, it, it doesn't matter that you didn't hear it. It just sounds like a, um, a really old uh, floppy drive uh, spinning up. <laughs> so it's a, bit, uh, it's a bit silly. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I thought I had the desktop set up, but it'll take me too long to sort that out, so I, I won't fiddle with it now. Right, so what, um, and that was what I was trying to do. I need to get a pointer. Let me just see if I can add a pointer quickly. Yeah, that's like, like I said, don't worry too much about the... Uh, I'm just going to see if I can no for whatever reason it's uh, capturing all the all that okay so I, I won't be able to what I'll do, all I'll do is I'll just navigate down to it so um, so the game is to uh, complete all the tasks. And every time you complete a task, new tasks will appear. Once you've completed the tasks, they'll, they'll appear down here, right? Each task that you get looks like this. It's a description, a graphical representation, and the truth table. And, right, there's... there's um, 4-bit NAND or 16-bit NAND gates, right? Um, this is a 1-bit NAND gate, so it, it just got the, the standard truth table. A 4-bit NAND gate. Uh, is a bus version, right? And it applies the... Uh, I think those inputs should actually be 4 bits wide rather than 16 bits wide for that one because that's the 16 bit one. Right, and then there's not, 4 bit not, 16 bit not, AND gates, OR gates, exclusive OR gates, all that sort of stuff. Right, so here's a, here's a more detailed example. And this is for the exclusive OR gate. And there's the specification. You get the specification when you start. And then what your job is, is to actually write the design. And uh, here's a, an example. I, I started out with my having to implement an exclusive OR, and I didn't have an exclusive OR native block to use. I had to write out exclusive OR in terms of ANDs and NOTs and OR gates. And I had my two inputs, input one and input two. And, um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I shouldn't be playing with that. Okay, so, um, the four parts of this design are the inputs, the outputs, the components or the parts, and the wires, the connections between the parts, right? And you can see um, the inputs are named in one and in two, the output is named out, and the parts, the, there's two AND gates, AND one and AND two, there's two NOT gates, NOT one and NOT two, 
and there's an OR gate just called OR. And I've, what I've done is I've made input one and input two go to not one and not two. So the output of not one is going to be uh, in one bar. The output of not two is going to be in two bar. And then I connect up input one to one input of AND one. I connect the output of not two to the other input of AND one. I connect one in the input two to one input of AND two. I connect not one to the uh, input of AND two. And then I take the output of those two AND gates and put it each into the one input of the OR gate. And then my output, my final result for the exclusive OR operation goes to the output. And that's what you've got to do, right, for the game. Um, you can edit this. I don't know whether I can edit this. Let's see if I can edit it. I, I've, I've already completed this one, so I don't know whether I can... Um, Yeah. So let me go back to the tasks that I haven't done, right? So this is a much more complicated uh, thing that I have to d design. It's a decoder. And it's, it's used to, to take, what is it, a 16-bit instruction, right? And decode it to actually do something with the... Um, in the CPU and this is where we start I haven't I haven't tried tackling the decoder yet this is as far as I've gotten for the uh, in the game and we've got a 16-bit instruction that's what the input is and then the outputs we've got to produce uh, C to M load A load D load M op 1 op2 of which there are two bits, opcode of which there are four bits, jump if zero, and a constant. And we've got to figure out what parts, right, and I can I can edit, right, um, I can edit this and say that, you know, that I need a, uh, I don't know, um, and one, right, and there's my there's an AND gate that I could now use to figure it to, to figure out. I probably don't just want to use an AND gate. I've got more complicated devices that I, I can use um, in my completed list. I can use multiplexes, I can use various other things that I've I've designed. You don't have to finish all of these things. Some of these completed logic circuits are done by uh, I've forgotten what the, the game called it. There's a, a helper person. Have you met Ted? Ted is the uh, the helper person. Right? Uh, and he'll, uh, once you generate some of the devices, he'll go ahead and um, generate the others. Like I said, um, there should be a key for 24 of the 27 of you. I'll, I'll try and get keys for the um, the other three of you shortly but uh, I will um, the the number of students in the class was bouncing around between 22 and 24 so I um, I didn't see the uh, uh, the extra three students until after I would asked the uh, maker of the game for the the keys that he gave me so that's a pity but uh, we'll, we'll get there Okay, any questions about the game? Uh, you will need to create a, a, a Steam account. Yep, yes, thanks Anthony. The, um, if you have a look in Blackboard, I've, I've, uh, I won't show you the screen because uh, you'll be able to see all the keys and I don't want, to, don't want all those keys going live on, uh, on YouTube. Um, but yeah, if you go into Blackboard, you should be able to see um, uh, keys for uh, uh, for the game. 
and you, you'll need to, there's a bit of, I think there's a bit of an instruction there about how to do it. Um, so we'll see. Okay, I'm going to leave uh, micro hard, but um, certainly uh, try and play the game. It's worth 10%. Um, if I can't figure out how to get keys for the extra three, I'll just disregard that 10% as part of your um, assessment. But I, I think it's actually a good a good tool to learn some of this uh, VHDL stuff. Yeah, so let's just see where that is. Yeah, so this is the... Uh, this is under assessment and the micro hard game. And I did a, a product activation on my Mac. So it's, um, uh, it might look a little different on the, the, on the windows, but you install the steam application and then you select activate a product and go through there. Um, uh, EULA and use a license agreement. And then eventually you'll get to be able to put the key in and you'll be able to uh, install the key. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to continue with some of these slides. I, I don't think, I, like I said, I, I won't have time to talk to all of them. And I do want to briefly talk about how will we well um, that's a good question how do you how are you going to uh, show that you've completed the game well um, I suggest you take a screenshot of the game either a screenshot on your PC or just take a picture with your phone of the the PC screen um, and then upload that I think that's what I what I intended in this in this uh, in this assessment right so um, Yeah, so this is, you should be able to uh, browse your computer for a picture and just submit the, um, submit the picture as uh, an indication. Um, depending on what picture you upload, because um, I haven't finished the game myself yet, so um, I, I may ask you to, to take another screenshot somewhere along the way, but uh, uh, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go. It, it should be easy enough to figure out. Okay. Let's have a look at this one. Back to the slides. And I don't want to talk to... Right, so... This is a useful thing to know. As I, I think I told you um, when I was talking about that example exam question, um, the order of the instructions outside of a process block um, doesn't matter because they all happen at the same time. Right? So um, that sounds a little freaky if you're used to uh, programming languages where it's it's a sequential walk through the uh, the statements and that that is available like I said in the process block of the HDL that is available because sometimes you need that um, but in general everything's happening at once so you've got um, you've got to be careful Right, the, the two main hardware description languages, uh, VHDL is the one that I'm going to be using, and Verilog. Verilog is a little bit newer. It has some advantages. It's a little bit, perhaps a little bit more verbose than VHDL, which may be a disadvantage. Um, but 
even I haven't actually programmed much in Verilog, um, but it seems pretty pretty similar to VHDL once you get the hang of it. And um, there's there's lots of examples around about it. The uh, the Nanta te Tetris book uses its own simplified version of HDL, um, and it, it they they have a, a a program that lets you uh, write in the HDL. I, I'd rather, I thought about using it, but I decided that we'd be better off using the real version of um, Quartus to, uh, to to do the, the compilation, because it's, um, I, I'd rather you actually learn a real hardware description language that we can actually get onto the board that we're using, um, rather than first of all learning, well, the other thing was I wanted to use the game, and the game uses that un yet another simplified version of the HDL. So I didn't want to have the game's version of HDL, Nanta Tetris's version of HDL, and VHDL. So at least with the with the game, that's a clear distinction from from everything else we're doing in the class. Okay. So hardware simulation. Um, this is uh, probably not relevant because this is the simulation that we that they do in their uh, in their code. So maybe I shouldn't do that. One of the things that we we often want to do in um, devices, particularly CPUs is we don't want to just deal with one bit of information, we want to deal with buses. And that's what this uh, this example is, right? It's a 16-bit a, a adder. We want to add two 16-bit numbers together and get a 16-bit, probably plus one carry bit result output, right? And there's, there's all sorts of ways you can decouple um, those arrays of bits. In this case, it's ta saying that the, the inputs are a, an array of four bits and it ands um, some of the bits together. And it's using some temporary variables to do that. And we won't go through that one. Oh, maybe we will. These might be okay. Right, I, so far I've talked about um, elementary gates, right? And or not. I talked a little bit about exclusive or. Um, just as it says up here, there are variants of those and or and not gates for multiple bits. Right, and the, the micro hard game goes through those uh, multiple bit uh, versions. Um, so, and the aim of the, uh, the this project one is to take the NAND gate that we, we, we start with, remember it's a universal gate, and we build all of these other things out of it. Right, and one of the other things is a thing called a MUX or a multiplexer. And a multiplexer is, um, uh, has two inputs, A and B. It has a third input select, which allows you to choose between input A or input B. And if select is low in this instance, select is zero, then the output equals A, and if the um, select is high, then the output equals B. Excuse me, I just have to cough. <coughs> Sorry, one of the... Um, problems of uh, talking, me talking so much, is I, I do need to drink occasionally just to uh, make sure my throat doesn't get too dry. Otherwise I cough. So, um, yeah, so that's what a multiplexer does. 
right? And there's two ways of looking at the multiplexer. One of them is a, as a full truth table. And you can see that in the, uh, the center of the screen in the center middle. We've got the three inputs, A, B, and select, and we've got the output out. Another way of looking at it is in the abbreviated version where we just place the, the input A when select is zero and input B when select is one. Okay. And let's see if we can go to the next slide. And here's another um, more complicated gate. And this is a, um, a multifunction gate. This one can be an AND gate or it can be an OR gate, right? So if select is zero in this case, then the output is A AND B. If select is one in this case, then the output is A or B, right? So for the one uh, device, we can tell, we can change what its operation is. And there's an example of the, the Nanta Tetris HDL of how to, how to do that. And this is just looking at the, uh, how to implement it. There's another version, another complex, more complex device that um, we sometimes use, and that's called a demultiplexer. And the reason it's called a demultiplexer, as it says on the screen there, is it's because it's like the inverse of a multiplexer. Well, what, what happens is we get a single bit input, and then the select determines whether we go to uh, uh, output A or output B, right? And as you can see in the, the code there, if select is zero, then the input goes to pin A and B gets a zero. Whereas if select is one, the input goes to pin B and A is zero. And it allows us to pull out, uh, like I said, like it says, it's, it's like the inverse of a multiplexer. Right, and the way you use it is for serial communications. Right, you might have two channels, the blue channel and the red channel, the top channel and the bottom channel here on the left hand side. You multiplex the numbers together in order to get the alternating red and blue bit stream that's in the middle between the MUX and the DMUX. And then you get uh, uh, at the other end, you demultiplex them to get the, the ones and the zeros from the blue in one channel and the ones and the zeros from the red in the other channel. Okay, and then I, I, I won't talk too much about the, the rest of this. This is all a little bit um, more specific to what uh, the, the Nanta Tetris syllabus rather than what I need to talk about. But I thought this was a good, um, it had some nice notes at least at the beginning. So, uh, so have a look at that. Let me just take a quick, uh, that's all. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about um, what I've just talked about so far? No? Okay. So the other slide deck, which I is also a little too long to get through in one sitting, and I'm probably not going to use all of it, um, but I'll, I'll talk briefly about it, is uh, 
Chapter 5 of uh, with, my, with My Moss and Tochi. Right. So I'm just going to quickly talk about another sort of device that uh, is a little bit more complicated than just an and, an or, an, or a not gate, and that's called a flip flop. Right? Because flip flops are one of the fundamental building blocks for um, combinatorial and sequential logic. A flip-flop is, one way to think about a flip-flop is as a memory device. And as soon as we need to do sequential logic, that is logic that works through a sequence of operations, we need to keep capture the what part of the sequence we're in, so we need some sort of memory, and a flip-flop lets us do that. All right, and, and this is, this, you should have gone through some of this in, in 363, um, so some of this may not be directly relevant to what we're doing here, but it does have the, uh, the, uh, the basics. So this is where I wanted to start. Here we've got a, uh, a system and it's got inputs along the bottom, it's got outputs on the top, and it's got stuff happening in the middle. And the two prime components are combinational logic gates and memory elements. The combinational logic are the AND, OR, NOT, NAND, NOR, exclusive OR gates that you talked about. And then the memory elements capture some of what's happening in the combinational logic. And then as you can see down the bottom, feed back that logic into, uh, from the memory elements into the, the combinational logic. And as I said, the most important memory element is a flip-flop. And a flip-flop can be made uh, out of actually logic gates, funnily enough. Um, and normally a flip-flop has a normal output and an inverted output, so you can access Q or Q bar. Um, and it has a variety of inputs depending on what sort of flip-flop it is. There are other names for flip-flops. Sometimes they're called a latch and sometimes they're called a bistable multivibrator. Because uh, what you can do, depending on how, you, how the um, flip-flop is configured and how it's connected up, you can make the flip-flop oscillate. Right, the first one is the, the, the NAND gate latch. And this is the, 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 the basic flip-flop. And it has an input set and an input clear or reset. Um, so the inputs are what are called active low. So that means when you put a zero on, that's saying it to telling it to do something. And when you put a one on, that's telling it not to do something. So it's sort of the inverse of what you would normally have, which is an active high input. Um, so just be wary. Uh, what you will see if there's a, a block that has an input on it, not the standard gates like we have down the bottom on this screen, but if you have a block with a, an active low input on it, you will see that the input has um, a. Uh, you'll see the input has a um, a bubble on the input. You can see here the NAND gates have a bubble on the output. If there's a bubble on the input, that says that the input is active low. Uh, 
right so here's a here's an a blown up version of the uh, the NAND gate latch um, and I think I might just have to I'm getting some uh, messages on the other from the uh, the other chat uh, other discord chat so I'll, uh, I'll I'll stop that so I don't get too confused right so is that the one yeah that's the one oh I really don't like uh, animated transitions anyway um, so here we want to uh, we're, we're pulsing the set input to the zero state so you can see over here that there's a it's logic one which is inactive remember it's an active low so we go low from t0 to t1 and we go high and then the aim is that uh, originally the output q was zero and when we pulse the output goes high um, once we're in that state if we started out with the Q output at 1 and we pulse the set input nothing changes right the the set input is supposed to set the output to 1 if it's already at 1 we don't need to change it if it was at 0 let's go back sorry about that if it was at zero, we do need to change it. Okay, so that's that's that one. And then the next one is if we pulse reset to low, then uh, the idea here is that um, we want to make Q bar go high. So in the first instance, Q bar is already high, so we don't need to um, we don't need to change its output. And in the second instance, uh, Q bar is low, so we want to reset it, reset the output, um, and we do it that way. In both cases, <clears throat> Q ends up being low. In the previous example, Q ends up being high. Okay, so the actual diagram of the uh, circuit is there. That looks a little different from what we had before, right? Here we've got NAND gates, and here we've got NOR gates. What you should be able to see using De Morgan's law is... Um, the following right is that uh, so other ways to draw logic right so because we can use De Morgan's laws we can change this device to this device and A, B and X is exactly the same as A, B and X. Right? Similarly, if you had a NOR gate and apologize for my poor writing, then we can change those two inputs to inverting inputs and we can change the gate to an AND gate and we can change the output to a non-inverting output so it's C, D and Y and that is also C, D and Y 
We could do the same thing for an AND gate. It might not make a lot of sense, but the AND gate can also be written. But now we've got to invert everything. Right? So these, t the ones in the left hand side are equivalent to the ones on the right hand side. And what we're doing is we're replacing a non-inverting input with an inverting input. We're replacing an inverting output with a non-inverting output. And we're replacing an AND with an OR. That's the only thing I've been doing in all three of those examples. Okay, so that's why the the diagram on the left is exactly the same as the previous diagrams we had where they had explicit NAND gates. Those are still NAND gates, they're just drawn a little differently. But normally, um, we don't even draw that, much, that amount of detail, we don't want to know. We just draw a box that says latch, it's got an S bar input and an R bar input and a Q and a Q bar output. And the bubbles on the input of the S and R input just indicate that it's an active low input. Okay, so that's just a summary of the NAND gate. And we can do something similar with a, a NOR gate. And this time it's, it's a, the inputs are active high and we get the same operation, but now the S and R inputs on the latch don't have a bubble on the input, so they're, they're non-inverting inputs. Um, so it works very similarly, but uh, uh, we, it, the logic is a little different. I won't go through the details of that. You should be should be able to do that. So this is one of the problems with um, just about any electronic circuit. When you first turn it on, it's almost impossible to tell what state it's going to be in. So I don't know whether if you did uh, in 363, if you uh, did any state machines, um, it's possible that you wrote up a, uh, a state machine that had, I don't know, 10 states. So you needed to use four bits to, to encode those 10 states. So that meant that you had what, uh, four bits will give you 16 possible states. That means you had six states that were um, not being used. But if you turned on your, 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 your counter, your, your four bit counter, um, you wouldn't necessarily be guaranteed to start up in any particular state unless you forced it, right? So, um, this is uh, this is all. This is saying is is uh, you need to be careful about um, how to uh, how to force the state. I'm not going to do the debugging case study. I'll do that next time. I think I'm just going to skip forward to section five four. Right. <clears throat> so even though we as we saw earlier in the, the timing diagrams that we had, we usually draw logic gates to be, uh, you know, abruptly high or abruptly low. That's not the case. What happens is we get a pulse that looks more like this. In fact, normally we get a lot more noise. We don't get flat bits at all. We get lots of uh, variation around the flat bit. Um, but the, the issue I'm dealing with here is we get a, a, a transition from low to high and a transition from high to low. 
and those transitions take time. So the TR is uh, what's called the rise time and the TF on the other side is called the fall time, right? And then the, the width is the 50% the time in the middle there. The rise time is usually taken from going from 10% of the final value to 90% of the final value. And the fall time similarly is going from 90% of the initial value down to 10% of the initial value. Right, and we might go, go the other way. We get a, a falling edge and then a leading edge rather than a, uh, uh, so we get a fall time and then a rise time. Um, but it's, it's basically basically the same thing. That's the rise time. And that's just saying what I said earlier about the 10%. Yeah, is there something else? Let's see what this is. Again, that's the, the fall time on the trailing edge. And that's the pulse duration or the pulse width. And it's taken at the 50-50 lines, right? So from the, the time it gets to 50% of its final value, to the time it falls off from 50% of its final value. So I, I, I've been very amused um, by the whole uh, online teaching discussion and talking about asynchronous delivery or synchronous delivery. I believe what we're talking about now, the way we're doing this class now is synchronous delivery, right? And uh, if I recorded this and got you to, um, without doing it live, and got you to review the videos in your own time, that would be called asynchronous delivery. Um, Digital circuits use those two words in very specific ways. So we, we may need to unpack that a little bit, right? An asynchronous system um, is a system that can change its outputs at any time if the inputs change, right? It doesn't matter what the timing is when the inputs change the outputs will change almost immediately. That's an asynchronous system. A synchronous system has it so that the output can only change at a specific time. And the, the way that's determined is the system has a clock, right? You all have computers, at least I hope you do, and you've probably at some stage looked at the um, uh, the speed of your computer, right? It might be a 1.2 gigahertz, it might be a 2.4 gigahertz, maybe it's up in the 4 gigahertz range. Some of the, the faster ones these days tend to be in the 4 or a higher gigahertz range. That rating, 4 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz or 1 gigahertz, is the clock. It's the, the speed at which the CPU, the central processing unit of your computer, is being clocked. And that's the clock we're talking about. Most of the examples we're going to be using, um, our clock cycle is much slower. The standard clock on the device that we're, we're going to be using, the, uh, uh, the Altera um, chip we're going to be using, it has a 50 megahertz clock cycle. That's still pretty fast, right, compared with human reactions. But um, it's not as fast as uh, the your standard uh, laptop or desktop computer clock speeds. And was there something else I wanted to see? Let's just check, just look through.
Okay, um, let's go back and talk about <clears throat> um, the flip-flop. Does anybody remember, I, I talked about the SR flip-flop, does anybody remember any other sorts of flip-flops? And I'm going to do bingo again. So Ray, do you remember any other sorts of flip-flops? Right, we've got the SR flip-flop. No, no, nothing from Ray. Let's try somebody else. Celine, do you remember any other flip-flops? I said uh, Ray, uh, I think that's Ray, yeah? So I think I've already asked you, Way. So the, the, the way this uh, bingo function works is if I've already asked you a question, I've called you out, um, it won't call you out again until we've gone through the whole current, uh, current class. No, Besh? D latch. Okay, thank you, Celine. Yeah, that's a that's a that's another one. The D latch. Okay, Jordan. What you got? J K. Yeah, that's another one. Okay, let's see if anybody else. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Lip, Lipronica? <laughs> Excuse my pronunciation. Any uh, suggestions? And try another one. Bingo. Amaziah, how about you? You got a, a suggestion? T, yeah, that's a good one. T flip flops good. So SR, D latch, JK, T. Is there another one? I keep forgetting. I, I'm not sure now. I'll, I'll see if somebody else is. Eddie, how about you? You got a, a thought on flip flops? Like I said, I'm not sure. I think we've got most of them. And these are not the sort of flip-flops we're looking at, right? We're not looking at footwear. Let's see what the... Ooh. It looks like we've got most of them. I don't know what an Earl latch is. That's interesting. So this is one of the things I was talking about with the um, uh, we there's a where propagation delays can be a problem. And it looks like this Earl latch was aimed at trying to uh, get rid of that. So SR JK variations on the SR, we just saw the two, the NAND and the NOR variations. Okay, so I think we've got, we've got most of them. Yeah, thanks Eddie. Um, Adonic, I don't know whether you've come up yet. Um, 
with uh, the let me just see if I can check the list of um, yeah so uh, that's the list of people who have come up so far and I, I can't see uh, I can't see your name there yet ah <laughs> oh really okay sorry <laughs> okay I didn't realize thank you ah okay yeah I, I can see Adonica R is the, the, the nickname in the, the chat, but I, I didn't realize that was your uh, na name in the uh, in Discord. Okay, so where are we? Let's just go back to... to here. So I, I haven't talked about synchronous counter design, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to move that off until uh, talking about that next week. So we're coming up to uh, about the hour. And what I would like to do next is to move into a, a lab format. Right, and this is all winging it a little bit. And I'll just uh, highlight that so that I remember when I come back to it, right? Um, what I want to do now is I want to do one of the labs, right? And where's my assessment? And... The lab I want to do, and I, I hope everybody had a chance to try and um, download uh, Quartus and Git and what have you, is I want to try and do get you to do this lab online now. Now, like I said, if you have a, um, a, a Mac, you won't be able to install it. I apologize for that. Um, however, what you can do is you can go to the Citrix, to the apps.ccsu.edu, right, which is what I'm trying to do now. Use your BlueNet username and password to log in. And I hope you should have access to the Engineering Science and Technology desktop. If you don't, please let me know. Okay, um, I, there, there was a problem earlier and I'm not sure whether the waitlisted people got added to the, the group that allows that. So this is, uh, it's a, a Windows PC and it aims to um, uh, run maybe there we go you only have three hours at a time on it but what you can do is it does have Quartus installed Quartus Prime 20.1 And you should be able to run that. All this lab is about, this lab doesn't do anything except to check that you have Git installed and that you have core access to quarters. You don't have to have it installed. You do have to have access to it. Um, you will probably have to install Git on your local machine. Um, because what I do is
I go to um, where's it gone? There it is. I have a Git directory, and I've downloaded the 466 Git repository to my local drive. And I think I've forgotten what the um, I've forgotten which one I asked you to look at. Yeah, it's in the test module directory, right? So here's the test module directory. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy that whole test module uh, directory from my local machine onto um, the, the thing in the cloud. I don't like trying to connect directly from the cloud to my local device if I can avoid it. It just sometimes it gets a bit funky. So that's going to take a little while. So what I'd suggest is um, you start trying to do the uh, start trying to do the lab. Um, if you need help, please uh, type something like that exclamation mark join Q into uh, Discord. That will uh, create a, a queue for you and I can talk to each of you individually. Um, be aware that we're still going to be going live and you're, you're, you're going to be uh, here. Um, I'm happy to answer questions via chat, but sometimes that, that might be a little low bandwidth, so I may need to um, access your... Uh, uh, get you to share your screen or something like that. Um, if we're going to sort things out. Anyway, I've I've copied that over, and then what I need to do in quarters is um, navigate to that test module, and then it it initially opens up only Verilog files. So you need to open up project files, right? QPF, and there's the uh, I think QPF stands for Quartus Project File. There's the VGA.QPF. And this is now the uh, the VGA file. This is actually a Verilog file. So, uh, and you can see it's not mine. This was originally uh, written in, uh, I think that the comments were all written in Chinese. So they, they don't come up correctly for me because um, I don't have the uh, the appropriate character set but I've what I've done is this is a um, uh, originally this just generated uh, a, a VGA pattern out of the VGA port on the board but I added a few bells and whistles or actually bells and buzzers um, right, I added uh, that the LEDs do something, that the beeper does something, that the seven segment displays do something with those, All right? And this is, um, like I said, this is VHDL, sorry, this is Verilog, the always part of Verilog is like the process part of VHDL. So each of these always commands is happening at the same time as all the others. And then the things, uh, what VHDL calls these things, they, uh, they call the, uh, the sensitivity list. So this always command gets triggered if any of the bits of beep counter change or if any of the the uh, bits of switch change um, 
actually this is sorry this one only changes if the the ninth bit of beep counter changes or the uh, second bit of switch change and this one only changes only executes if either the third or the second bit of switch changes this one executes on a positive edge of the clock this one executes on a positive edge of the VGA clock this one executes on a positive edge of the VGA clock and most of these are about the positive edge of the VGA clock. Okay. And then what you do is once you've got your Verilog in this case, or VHDL in our case done, is you can hit compile. And this task list should start running through. And I've already set this up so that it, it works quite happily. Um, so it's all good. But the, the, the thing that this VHDL or Verilog doesn't do, right? And now we've we finished executing and we've got a, <clears throat> we were, if we had this connected, we could download it to a, um, a device. Um, One thing this doesn't do, it, it, we've defined all the inputs and outputs, but there's another step we need to make. Let me just go back to Streamlabs and the bigger version, right? There's another step we need to make in order to get things to happen on this board. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go through Git as well. I just thought I'd start here and see where we are, right? So. There's the chip. That chip has lots of pins, right? These, these connectors around the outside are directly onto a lot of the pins of the device. But there's nothing that connects uh, where is it? Where are they? They're the highlighted bit here. There's nothing that connects these inputs and outputs to these pins on the device. So what we've got to do is Quartus has what's called a pin planner, right? And so here's our pin planner. This is the device we're using. It's a Cyclone 4E and it's this particular type of Cyclone 4E. And then down the bottom here, you can see we have all of the things that we talked about in our Verilog, the beep, the clock, all the bits of the digits, but pulled out as individual bits, um, the RGB, the horizontal sync, etc. Okay. And then um, V-Sync and the switches. And then we can connect up our logical names, our variables to particular pins, right? I can, I can go in here and select a particular pin on the device. Okay, so that's Quartus, but we've got to get there yet. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer Tommy's question. Before I go there, anybody have any questions about getting to Citrix? And um, please let me know, probably best by our email um, if, you, if you don't have access to that desktop. Um, but this, uh, I didn't have access to this and I wasn't sure whether Quartus was installed, but it does seem to be installed. So at least everybody, even those with a, a Mac should be able to, to run um, run Quartus via the Citrix server. Just a note on the Citrix server, these um, desktops are only available up until midnight. So make sure you've got, and they're only available three hours at a time. So make sure you've got 
um, you, you take that into account when you start working on it. Let's see if I can log out. I'll just kill it, I think. Okay. So, Git. Let's have a look at Git. So, how to how to start this? Uh, that's a good question, Adonica. I, you may need to register with the Intel site. I've I've forgotten. I think I had to. Um, let me just check the links. Where's my link list? There it is, links. You did have to, Anthony? Okay, yeah. And Justin, great, thank you. Sorry about that. I, um, you could probably just use a throwaway account <laughs> if, that, uh, if that's a, a problem. Yeah, actually, I, now that I now that you you mentioned, I do do think I had to uh, I had to down I had to register with the uh, with the site. That's not I I wouldn't uh, <laughs> just say CEO. That that'll that'll tell them. Okay, um, what was I going to? I was wanting to go to Git. So, well, let's start with GitHub, right? So, GitHub is like a uh, a cloud drive for your um, uh, for your files, and I use. I use GitHub quite a bit for various things. The um, the bingo function that I've been using is part of uh, Professor Broderick's DaveBot, which is a uh, um, a Discord bot that uh, we've both been working on. So there's there's a there's a few things there. Um, and the particular repository that I want you to look at is the one called CET 466 Digital Logic, right? And that's this one. And when you go to uh, GitHub and you want to get a copy, you can do it in a number of ways. If you don't want to install Git, you can just download a zip. Um, I would prefer to get you to use Git, so I would recommend against just downloading the zip, but to get things started, um, just download the zip if, you, if you're having problems. Um, so there's a couple of ways to access GitHub. One of them is via... Uh, SSH. SSH is secure shell. That's a way of identifying yourself to the server, um, or sometimes not needing to, but if you if you want to push, you usually need to. Um, push means to write back to the repository. Um, the nice thing about using SSH is that SSH doesn't need a password. You still need a credential and you need to create a credential. Um, but once you've created the cre credential and identified yourself with the server, you don't have to worry about passwords anymore. The other way to do it is using HTTPS. And the, the downside of using HTTPS is you need to type your password every time you you do a push or do a write to the repository. That may not be such a big deal. Um, I tend to set up using SSH. 
but let's let's just use uh, let's just use HTTPS and let me see if I can get a window and let me see if I can make it bigger so you can actually read it there we go uh, let's go to downloads right um, there are git clients that are visual that are GUIs I tend not to use them um, once you've got Git installed, right, and the I think the the link is there somewhere. Um, where is it? Tools for remote work. That's GitHub. Maybe I didn't put it, the the Git link in. There, I should put that in. I think you put it's... the link in the description for GitHub to get. Oh, did I? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I'd put it somewhere. I might put it in separately, right? So it's git minus scm.com. Okay, sorry, I've forgotten I'd put the <laughs> the face. Yeah, you don't want to see my face. That's that uh, that's perfectly understandable. Let me uh, get rid of that. Sorry. There we go. You gotta to fail to clone the repository. Okay. Um, so what I do is git clone. Oop, that's the wrong one. I forgot. I, I copied the wrong. Uh, let me just do what I was about to do and put that git link directly in here. So we've got it. So I don't have to. Uh, Right, so that link now is, is here and I'll just move it up to closer to GitHub. Okay, so I put it in there as well. That's why I didn't see it before I'd had that closed. But there's the Git client directly there as well. Okay, sorry about that. So uh, we need to get the repository URL again. And I'll use the HTTPS version. And I think this one's free. Uh, I, I can clone it directly without needing it. And this is what you should see. It is pretty large. So uh, it may take a while for you to clone it. And I, I see there's... Uh, can somebody um, uh, take a screenshot of the error you're getting with the fail to clone and uh, post it into the chat there so that I can... Um... I'm getting a file name is too long. I'll send you the direct link. File name's too long. Okay. Um... I got a checkout error. I don't know if that's different from what everyone else is getting. Okay. So, um, yeah, that, that's that's part of the problem, particularly under Windows, or it also happens under Linux and Mac OS. Um, what you may need to do is, because this is a reasonably large, as you can see, it's still going, and uh, I've already cloned it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it. I've already got a copy of this on my drive. Um, but um, what you may need to do... Oh, thanks, Javi. What's that saying? Let's have a look. Would you like me to send you a more close-up version of the exact one, not the long? Oh, that's it. That, well, that one's okay, actually. That one says clone succeeded, but checkout failed. Yeah, and that's what I get, too, so I don't know. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think that should be okay. Um, I'm not... I'm not asking you to push anything back to this particular repository. Um, you only need to be able to read stuff from it. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about failing to check out. Um, just check 
right, remember I, um, uh, where's it gone? That one. Uh, I don't know that I can. I don't think I can make that any bigger, unfortunately. No, I can't make that any bigger. Um, but basically what, um, what the only thing you really need out of that is if you navigate into that directory, into examples and into test module, and you should see something like that list of files in examples test module. And the file that you need to open up is vga.qpf. Yeah, I have the issue that it didn't download the all of it. It only downloaded the first uh, folder. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it didn't download the CMD files or the example files or the lab files. Which is kind of weird because it definitely did say it downloaded 100% of the data. Yeah, I didn't see where it was saving to at first, but I have that same. That's really bizarre. So, it's interesting. Fatal destination path already exists. It's not an empty directory. So, that probably just means you retried, you, you tried cloning before and the, the directory's already there. Um, the So, the one issue, um, Anthony, do you mind if I share your screenshot on the screen? Right, so... This is, um, if that's okay. So if this is the error, one of the problems that sometimes uh, happens is the, the directories after this, so in that repository, are also sometimes a little long. So what I would suggest is... Um, uh, making a, I don't know, a, a C colon slash git and um, trying to clone the, di the, the directory into C colon slash git rather than all the way down in users, Anthony, documents, github, CET 466, CET 466, digital logic, CET 466, digital logic. I think there's a limit of 1,024 characters in the Windows, um, uh, by default, in the Windows uh, operating system. I believe under Windows 10, there is a registry setting that means you can make it bigger, um, but I've forgotten what the, uh, I've forgotten what the, um, Oh, sorry, Matt. I didn't realize you were there. I'll, uh... Oh, yeah, you're probably cloning into the, the, the directory that you made, so it probably went down and down and down and down. Sorry, Matt, I just got to find where Matt is. There we go. Now you should be able to see the chat. Man, sorry about that. I thought um, I thought I'd added everybody. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, try try what doing what Anthony suggests that was says he's doing there and putting a the directory way up the top. Um, just uh, there is a like I said, I believe there is a way to do um, to in, extend Windows parts. Um, I've forgotten how to do it. That's two sixty characters. That's even worse. Yeah, so um, gpedit.msc, local computer, computer configuration, administrative template system, file system, NTFS, enable NTFS long paths. Um, and then this is the regedit version of doing the same thing. So I'll, I'll put that in the... Uh, in the links uh, in, in case that's a better in case you want to keep your directory structure and use that way of uh, extending the paths because that that could also be the issue Okay, so um, let me just um, go back to here, right? And I, um, I have the directory here and, right, this is the markdown version of the, the repository. Let's just have a look at what's in the repository and then I'll go back to talking a little bit about Git. Right, so the readme file here has a picture of the board. Maybe I should have used that earlier, right? So you've got the LEDs here, you've got the, um, the push buttons, you've got the seven segment display, that's the buzzer. Um, there's two ways to program this board. There's the JTAG way of programming it, and there's, I think it's, I've forgotten what A stands for, but it's the serial way of programming it. What happens when, um, uh, this, this device, this uh, Cyclone 4 Altera device, Altera is now owned by Intel, what happens is um, when this device is first powered on, it doesn't know anything. It doesn't connect any inputs to any outputs. It's just free to program. The first thing that happens on power up is it looks for a program to configure itself. And there is a ROM, sorry, a, not a ROM, a um, persistent RAM chip on board. I've forgotten which one it is. I suspect it's that one, but I could be wrong. Um, and it goes out to that chip and says, give me the program to run. And it downloads onto itself the program to run. And it'll con reconfigure it and can connect its inputs and its outputs to whatever the program says it should be doing. And so that's what happens when you first power it on. There's two ways, as I said, there's two ways of programming it. The JTAG way, the where this cable's connected at the moment, the JTAG way programs the um, non-persistent, the ephemeral memory on the chip itself, right? This input, doesn't program this chip, if this is the, the memory chip, but it doesn't program this chip, it programs the volatile memory on this, on this device, right? So the nice thing about that is, if you make a mistake and uh, something doesn't work on this device, all you have to do is hit the off button, hit it back on again, 
and it'll reload from here and you're all good all right so that's a when you're debugging stuff that's the best way to operate through the jtag interface <coughs> This AS interface can be programmed exactly the same way as the JTAG using Quartus, but what happens is um, it changes the memory here. So if you do that wrongly and it's got a bad program in it, this board will always load up in a bad state. So Mostly only use JTAG if you can avoid it. I may ask you to program it at the AS interface later on in the semester, but in general, just run your, your connections using the JTAG. Sorry, I, I, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent. This is just um, uh, the same picture of the board, but uh, pointing out some of the, the features on it. If you need to know how to connect up to some of the outputs, that, that pin planner that I showed you in quarters, here are the pinouts, right? If you need to turn on LED1, that's on pin 87. If you need to get the clock, that's on pin 109. If you want to program the, there's a, an infrared detector on the device, then that's on, uh, that's on pin 100. The VGA connectors, or pins are pins 100 to 106. 101, 103, 104, 105, 106. Wonder where 102 got to. Okay, so there's there's some good information there. You can see it on the website, um, or you can download it and you'll have access to it locally. Now, what I do, where I was going before, is um, just say I wanted to. Uh, make an example edit right I've just uh, made an example edit and what I should be able to see using git is um, oh, a couple of things it looks like I've I've edited the uh, an Excel spreadsheet that's there I've added a uh, I've edited readme and there's an untracked file so if you've made a modification to a file that's already in the repository it'll show up here if you've added a file that wasn't in the repository it'll show up as untracked okay and now what i can do is i can stage the files for commit that is um, maybe i don't want to commit everything here so i'm all in fact the only thing i want to do is i want to do a git add on the readme right and if I do a git status now you'll see that the readme file is highlighted in green so it's uh, it's staged for to, to, to be committed and then but the other changes I don't want to go into the repository just yet so I'm leaving them in either untracked or not staged I'm ready now to to commit that change I made so I do git commit and then I like putting a, a message in it um, example of a commit for CET 466 class right and <coughs> excuse me and now um, that is part of the repository on the copy of the repository on my local device on my local machine it's not changed up in github on the uh up here on the the website the github website yet right there's nothing that you can't see the extra text that i i put in there what i have to do to get it there is do a git push now none of you have read privileges or push privileges on this repository so if you tried to make a change and commit it, you could commit locally, but you wouldn't be able to push it to um, back to the server. And that push goes up, right? And now what we should see, if I refresh the page here, 
where we got to right there's my example edit now there's there's a bit of a problem just say somebody else comes along and decides to do an edit and okay it's still me but it's in a different copy of the repository right I just I just deleted what I just put in and just say um, I decided that uh, I decided I needed to make another edit you can see my local copy of the file hasn't changed even though I changed it on the server through the web interface, my local copy hasn't changed. So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to add the readme file. And I can commit that to my local copy and that all works. But now look what happens right because I started off from a different point than what's called the head the the the, the most recent version of the um, uh, the repository it's saying you can't do that in order to to fix that as it says there where does it say there I need to do a git pull and what git pull will do, it'll uh, try and um, uh, figure out the difference between the, the, the two changes, the deletion that I made on the server and the addition that I made locally. And it can't, right? And what you'll see is there's two pieces. There's this piece, right? Between the less than, less than, less than head and the equal signs. And then there's the greater than, greater than. And in this case, it, it hasn't picked up the fact that there was a, uh, something else happening. So what this means is that as, as it said there, Right? It said that there's a conflict. What? And it, it basically says, okay, the automatic merge failed. You need to fix the conflicts and then commit the result. So you need to go in there and delete the conflicts. And in fact, I don't want either of these edits in here, so I'm going to delete all of them. and commit that. And I'm going to say resolve conflict. Okay, and now everything's happy. It's gone back up to here and we should see well, it shouldn't actually change because I uh, I did the deletion here and we've got that. Okay. When, and it will happen, if particularly if you're working with a, um, uh, a lab partner, when it happens that you get a conflict, don't panic. It's, it's easy enough to resolve. You just have to, uh, to read through it. And figure out what the uh, what the resolution is. Sorry, I haven't been looking at the discussion. You created the new path, and now you're getting. Uh, okay. Um, so the yeah so maybe the uh, sorry about that I I haven't checked the uh, the details of the um, uh, that link but there you might be able to use regedit to to get there regedit 32 to uh, to try that 
Has, has anybody managed to get Quartus installed? I know uh, at least one of you has. Has anybody? I personally have not been able to get it on, installed on Windows, but when I booted up a virtual machine, I was able to get it on Linux. Oh, okay. Oh, that's all right. I mean, if you're, you're happy to do that, that's okay too. Um, but I did also edit my group policy, so I would be able to do it, and it still didn't allow me. Or actually, I already had it in. Uh, I already had the group policy to allow longer names. Hmm. Okay. Um, so the the only reason I so let let's try something else. Um, uh, yeah. So what I'd suggest with the um, Yeah, well, Dan, this is Windows and Microsoft. <laughs> um, of course they could. Um, I just haven't uh, come across that. So what all you need to do, um, well, you don't need to you don't need to access this repository using Git. You can just download the zip file, right? That'll be that should let you. Uh, Your last statement. Okay. Right, it'll take a while to download, but that'll get you the zip file. What I might do, now that we're, uh, why do we do this? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the best way to download this would be what I might do offline or maybe I can do it now is um, I got about half an hour to go maybe let me try and do it on yeah um, what I might do is I might see about just taking that test module and putting it into a, a new repository that way it'll be a lot smaller and uh, you should be able to um, should be able to access it so let me do that uh, so I'll make a new repository, um, CET 466 uh, test module, and it'll be public. I'll add a git ignore. Uh, let's not add a git ignore just for now. I'll add a readme. And we'll do that. So I can do that. Just do that. And commit the change. Now let's see if we can clone that to my local drive. I'm going to use SSH because I do want to be able to um, module okay git add star Okay, it's taking a while, but there we go. There it is. Let's see what that looks like on the...
Okay, so that should be, um, let's go with the HTTPS version. So let me put that link into the links directory. Okay, that way you, you, it's only pulling out the, uh, the tiny piece uh, that I want you to run for um, the, uh, the lab. And this lab, the only thing I want you to do is A, be able to use Git, and B, be able to run quarters. You can run quarters either on your local machine. Okay, cool. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for letting me know. Um, you can either run quarters on your local machine, or uh, you can run it on that... Uh... <laughs> no worries, Anthony. Um, you can run it on the... Uh... Uh, the CEST desktop, the, the Engineering Science and Technology desktop. And let me just check what I said there. Right. Oh, that was the other thing I, I, I do want you to do, is... Um, I do want to you to take a, a screenshot of quarters and I want you to take a screenshot of multi-sim. Before we get to quarters in a couple of weeks time I want to run a, a lab next week on multi-sim if we possibly can. Um, we'll, we'll see how we go. Uh, I'm not sure how many desktops are available or how many licenses but uh, we, we usually do it okay in the lab. Um, so, so we'll see. Uh, do you want that screenshot posted in the Discord, or do you want it on Blackboard? Uh, so this is the aim is uh, is to you know click on this lab one and then just uh, browse your computer for the screenshot and um, upload it there. Okay, just as a, a, a so that the the lab is done. I'm going to put all the lab. Where I eventually want to get to is you're going to have a, um, uh, I want you to write up the lab, but for this particular one, two screenshots are all, all that's required. One to show quarters, that you have access to quarters, and one to show that you have access to um, multi-sim. Uh, yes, Dan, uh, uh, just taking a screenshot of the CCSU desktop, that's okay too. Just so, I, all I'm trying to, um, get is that everybody has access to those two com those two programs, Quartus and Multisim. And I uh, Multisim should be available on the desktop. I didn't check during this session, but it, it, it always has been. And Quartus has been added recently. So uh, and I only saw that yesterday. So I'm I'm glad that was there. Okay. Does it matter which version of Quartos you want? Because I noticed that 20.2 is available. 20.2 uh, is not available in the light version. So 20.1 is the one I've been using. Um, so so just go with 20.1 if you if if it okay. makes okay. Um, yeah, they 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 tend to not port uh, the the latest and greatest version of their their code to all platforms in the first instance so they're still working on moving 20.2 to some of them which is why it's not available for some platforms okay um, I don't have much else to talk about uh, I'm happy to stay online for the next half hour or so to uh, if anybody <laughs> that was quick Anthony thank you um, if uh, if anybody's interested um, or, or needs help um, but that's all I wanted to get through today um, we will I will be taking a bit more of an in-depth walk through Quartus uh, and multi-sim next week um, uh, but uh, I, this is all I wanted. I just wanted to, to try out. I wanted to try out using OneNote 
for, for showing notes. I wanted to try out the bot for uh, um, the, the bingo piece. I wanted to uh, uh, I wanted to talk to you about the course. One thing I actually before I completely go away, um, there is one thing we do need. I would like you to make sure you read is the draft syllabus. Um, if you want to change the directory where it downloads, what you can do is you can do uh, git clone. Um, whatever the repo name is, and then directory. Right, if you need you to. Also, yep. You can also just change to your, uh, where you are in your command prompt to whatever, wherever you want to be. Right, if you just do it, if you just do it this way, it'll just uh, download into a directory called repo, or whatever the name of the repository is. But if you want to put it somewhere else, you, you know, you can go tilde slash, uh, somewhere else, right? And it'll put in the, into my home directory called somewhere else. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want you to actually do too much at the moment. The main thing is to see that you've got connectivity with Git and with, uh, you can fire up quarters and you can fire up um, multi-sim. I, I had some problems with, um, uh, what was it, CET 179 and getting students access to the various things there. Um, so I decided to put a, this is effectively a lab zero. Um, it doesn't actually do much in terms of lab, but I just want to make sure that everybody has the right tools or access to the right tools um, so that when we go forward, we can, uh, we can, we can do that. Okay, if nobody has any other questions, I think I'm going to leave it there for today. I, I do have one quick question. Yeah, go for it. Um, I have the version 14.1 uh, of Multisim. Is that okay? Yeah, that should be fine. Um, we, um, I've forgotten what the latest version is. Is it 14.2 or something? But um... I believe it's 2. Yeah, no, fourteen point one is perfectly okay. Uh, don't, don't. I, I wouldn't worry too much about the the, the dot versions of it. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, let's leave it there. I'm going to uh, where's Streamlabs? I'm going to shut down the. Uh, let me just go bigger. I'm going to shut down the um, YouTube stream. And uh, then I'll shut down the 